hope you're having a great Sunday so far. Uh, this is uh, really a great time for us to be together despite uh, the coronavirus and all the things that are going on. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Turnwall, and I'm right here in Turnwall's studio, uh, a.k.a. his uh, garage. And I, f I appreciate uh, all the work that he's put into uh, getting things, uh, content out to everyone during this time. Uh, when I was a kid, and uh, I, uh, I was a kid once, and I used to watch this show called The Romper Room. And I feel a little bit like the romper room today. And uh, but uh, the technology has changed. And what it was was that uh, this woman would come on stage and she would say, "I see Mary, I see John, I see Carrie uh, out there." And it was all make believe. But today, uh, obviously, technology has allowed us to be able to do that. So from uh, our garage to you, good morning, and I look forward to going through the scripture together. Uh, but before we start, I, I'd like to just give a shout out to uh, Doug Bundy. Uh, Doug lost his sister this past week, and uh, Mark lost uh, his dad uh, last week as well. So let's be mindful of our brothers and sisters who are going through uh, some really tough time, especially uh, in the midst of uh, all of this as well. I'll be working through uh, some of the slides and uh, go through uh, Exodus 24 to 31 together. No, what I've been feeling this past week is uh, I think what uh, Habakkuk must have felt. And as he was thinking about his own situation, um, I think about this passage here in Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 5. It says, Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed, for I am about to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. You know, if I were to tell you of all the stuff that's going on uh, just within the last two weeks, uh, three weeks ago, uh, you would be like, Ken, you're, you're out of your mind that whole economies uh, would be shut off and that people would be working from home. Not just a few isolated people or area, but uh, the disaster has uh, really gone around the world. And hopefully it's given us pause a little bit to really think about just uh, what's going on and to, to really see uh, what God is doing and what is he allowing uh, to happen as well. We've been going through the uh, book of Exodus together, and uh, Todd did a great message uh, last week and uh, appreciate about uh, his story about the horse and that uh, his main point was that we don't know. We don't know if this is a blessing or this is a curse, but that uh, we need to really uh, just hang on and, and really figure out and, and learn about uh, what God is trying to do and, and to teach us as well. And amazingly, the book of Exodus, sometimes we think, well, this is like a long time ago. This, this stuff happened about uh, 3,400 years ago. And what does that have to do with me? And uh, I'll be honest with you, it's amazing just to be able to look through the book and see how relevant the word is uh, even to our day today. And uh, as God was giving out the laws to the people of Israel, uh, it is amazing just to think what, what a head start that they had, uh, that God would give them uh, just his, his law that uh, would govern their country as they started off uh, as a brand new country coming out of, uh, of Egypt. And uh, that they were way ahead of their times. And some of these laws that we're going to be looking at uh, are still relevant today. And as a matter of fact, some of these laws are the laws that we are that we have built our country upon. And some of these laws are laws that other countries have not even caught up to uh, as well. So when we read these passages, let's be grateful. Let's be grateful that God is uh, giving us his word. And let's be attentive as well. In the book of Psalms, in Psalms 119, it says this. It says that uh, to all perfection, I see a limit, but your commands are boundless. And uh, God's word is boundless. Uh, even though he was speaking to a particular people at a particular time, uh, God, we can, uh, we can still uh, use his word today, and they are as relevant today as ever, the principle of his words as well. It is impossible to cram in uh, all the points and all the different things uh, in 30 minutes, but uh, I will do my best. And I want to sum up 
these passages within these chapters in one sentence. And if there's nothing else we get, if we get this, uh, we're going to be good. If we are to be a church, the church, that the world needs us to be, uh, we must be willing to let God shape our community and our worship from the inside out. Okay, let's read that again. If we are to be the church that the world needs us to be, that God envisions us to be, we must be willing to let God shape our community and shape our worship from the inside out. You know, we talk a lot about um, individually spiritual formation. And uh, having lived in Asia and having lived here in America as well, Americans are very individualistic, which is good. It's a great thing. You know, we have these ideas that come from individuals that are willing to uh, go out of the norm of society. And I think that's what makes America great. It is, in many ways, the marketplace of idea, the ideas. But, you know, what I appreciate living in Asia was that uh, people thought more of community. And there, I think, more of an understanding of communities and how communities work and how much we rely on one another. That what we do affect one another as well. That we're not just these individual islands that do things that, you know, no one else cares about. And I think certainly with the coronavirus that's going on right now, it's unprecedented, right? So I think it's teaching us that we really are dependent on one another. Our health, our life and death even, is uh, dependent on one another. And uh, it's amazing how these scriptures come to life, as we will see even today. But in order for us to understand these next uh, few chapters in 24 to 31, we need to go back a little bit and understand uh, the scriptures that went ahead of us. And certainly in Exodus chapter 20, uh, we see God's command in uh, the Ten Commandments, what is called the Decalogue, which is a Greek word. Deca means ten. Log means words. The ten words of God. And the first one that he mentioned in the Ten Commandments is this. I am the Lord, uh, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. The commandments of all commandments. God says, listen, you just came out of slavery where you were slaves to a master who was Pharaoh. And now that you're coming out, I don't want you to be slave to somebody else. I want you to be my people and I want to be your God. You know, God just didn't say, I am, you know, uh, God. And that's it. But, you know, the Bible says here that God gives us his name. And uh, the Jews were so um, respectful of that. And even people that uh, who interprets the Bible, that they were so respectful of God's name that they sometimes when they see God's name in the Bible, they don't use it. And they use a thing called a tetragrammaton. And uh, modern day uh, interpreters use, I am the Lord versus God's name, which is represented by those four letters. Tetragrammaton meaning four letters. So what's the significance of that? The significance of that is that God says, listen, I am, I'm a personal God. I'm not this God that's far away. And we're going to see that as God really wants to live with the people of Israel. And God says, listen, this is my name. I'm telling you who I am. And I don't want you to have anyone else that you put before me. So that's uh, the first commandment, is that God alone is to be worshipped. And there's a lot that we can go further into this, but for the sake of time, we won't. We're going to look at the second commandment here. And that is, number one, who we're going to worship. But number two, God outlines and he gives us dimensions on how we are to worship him. And that is found in the second commandment. He says, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, I am a jealous God. You know, God has feelings. God has a heart for us and he is righteous in his jealousy. 
uh, not like us when we get jealous about petty little things or or things that are not true. When God is jealous, he's, he's jealous because he is bound to us in this relationship and that he is perfect in his relationship with us. You know, what's amazing about uh, the temple and the tabernacle that we're going to look at is how we see that God really is a minimalist and that uh, in the temple and the tabernacle uh, itself, you don't see a lot of different, it, it's not very ornate, it's very simple. In the Holy of Holies, as we're going to see, you see the Ark of the Covenant. And then what's in the Ark of the Covenant is the Ten Commandments itself. And that represents the heart of God and His relationship with us. As a matter of fact, there's an interesting uh, part in history in about 19, uh, 19, in about 63 B.C. And the, uh, the great Roman general um, came into Jerusalem and he and the Roman uh, soldiers came in directly into the Holy of Holies because he wanted to, to see. And that was what it was like back then. Uh, you know, they want to see a representation of who God is, the God of, you know, there's certainly there's a representation of this God that he's heard so much about, uh, this God that is so um, standoffish to him, probably. This God that demanded soul worship. And uh, he went into the, the Holy of Holies, and uh, he wanted to see, and he was so disappointed. He was so disappointed that he didn't see this manifestation of uh, God and this temple where there's, you know, inside this place where uh, you see this statue. And he just saw this ark, and he walked away uh, pretty disappointed because it wasn't what he expected to see. As a matter of fact, for the Christians as well, a lot of people during New Testament time thought that the Christians were godless because they didn't see this physical manifestation of Yahweh God. So it was, I thought it was pretty uh, interesting. So let's move on to uh, chapter 24. They had moved out of Egypt. God had shown the ten plagues, forcibly removing the people uh, the Israelites out and into this this place, a, a liminal place where they were going to go into the land that God has set for them to go. But before they were going to go there, and God was making preparation, kicking people out and stuff like that, uh, he was trying to get the people's hearts to be what he wanted them to be. He was preparing them. And as Moses was coming down uh, and uh, and and meeting the people from the mountain after receiving the Ten Commandments and re receiving the instructions from God, this is what he read in uh, Exodus chapter 24. He says, Then he took the book of the covenant, which is Exodus 20 uh, to Exodus 23, verse 33, and read it to the people. They responded, We will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. So, good start. Right? So, uh, certainly it wasn't perfect, as we will see in the, in the wandering of, of uh, the Israelites. But this was a good start. They read, you know, the, the book of the covenant. And the people at this point says, you know, we're going to obey God. And we've seen all the great things that he has done. So, what was in the book of the covenant? The book of the covenant was all the laws, not all, but there were some general, specific laws that God wanted these people to have. And he was working with them from the inside out. You know, I remember when I was a young uh, Christian in probably 1989 or so, I decided to read all of the books of the Bible, starting from Genesis. And that was probably the best decision that I ever made. Because I didn't want to know God from just these pieces of uh, scriptures that I saw that were taken out, perhaps out of context. I wanted to see God for who he was and who he is, the complete picture of God as he presented it in the Bible. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll always count that decision as probably one of the best decisions I've ever made. Because I think a lot of people make that mistake today. Because what they do is that we, we they, they, they take scriptures out of context. And a lot of people do that today and they go, you know, God, I can't worship a God like that. And they're turned off by God and at the same time, it's sad because they cheat themselves 
out of really knowing who God is. Because they take one scripture or skeptics who take these different scriptures out of context and they say, well, how can you worship a God like that? And they don't really know who God is. I love scriptures like this. In Exodus chapter 21, as we, we look at um, the book of the covenant, as um, Moses as, uh, was reading to the people, it says, anyone who strikes a person with a fatal blow is to be put to death. However, if it is not done intentionally, but God lets it happen, they are to flee to a place uh, I will designate. You know, if we don't read the Bible carefully, we're going to miss a lot of great theology that is embedded in this, uh, in these scriptures, in these laws. Look what it says there. God was talking about people that have fought together. They, they, they got into a fight, and uh, inadvertently, you know, this one person kills another person. And I got into a conversation with a guy today, you know, a guy who's got his PhD in, um, in the Bible, in particularly Hebrew Bible, and he was disappointed. He's saying, how can God allow the coronavirus to happen? And uh, he was telling me and how he was just wrestling with these things. And I told him just from this one passage that things happen and it's not God's fault. People fight. You can't blame God for these people fighting. And the Bible yet says here, and it gives us a little glimpse of, of what's going on here. It says that, but God lets it happen. And I think about just how God prevents things from happening and things that we don't even know that could happen that God prevented from happening. And uh, I appreciate God. And I appreciate that he sets the mentions on things that uh, could be even worse. And so when I read these laws, here's the scripture I think about as Paul wrote to the Romans. He says, Consider therefore the kindness and the sternness of God as well, simultaneously. That God is kind. And at the same time, that we need to respect God's sternness also. That he allows things to happen and he allows us to go through the consequences of our actions as well. Here's another passage that is pretty relevant to our time as well, especially. It says, do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd and do not show favoritism to a poor person in a lawsuit, right? It can be worked the other way as well, where sometimes we get sentimental towards someone who's been oppressed. Sometimes we get sentimental for someone that we perceive is, you know, poor or disadvantaged. And God says, we don't do that neither, okay? That judgment and fairness goes both ways. I love this passage. Do not follow the crowd. And as Christians, we are called to be holy. We are called to have character. We are called to stand out. We are called to have courage in times when um, the crowd seems to be going in a way towards destruction. You know, um, I want to share a little bit about uh, my own situation and this current situation when the economy is doing really, uh, it, it's pretty pretty scary what's going on. It reminds me of 2008 and the uh, financial meltdown that happened uh, more than 10 years ago. You know, before that, about 2006, Lena's father had passed away and he left us with some money. And it's ironic that I got in trouble with money after having money because we always had just enough in the mission field Somehow, some way, we'd we're always had enough, and we would never have more, but we would never have less. We would always have enough. But Lena's dad left us with some money, and um, and with that money, I got all caught up in the financial, um, um, you know, I, I just greed in just buying these homes that we had no business buying, and it was free and easy money, and we leveraged loans. Uh, during that time, I remember there was no docs, you know, doc, no documentation, and you get a loan for like three hundred sixty thousand uh, dollars, just because you said you had money, and um, and and lo and behold, what happened was that it collapsed, as we all know, and a lot of people lost their homes, a lot of people lost. Uh, it, it took years to to recover 
from that meltdown. And that's why the government is really going so fast in, in just making sure that we stave off uh, that collapse. And I remember people telling me, you know, Ken, it happened to everybody. Everybody did it. It's true. Everyone did it. I mean, a lot of people participated. And I'm not saying that we can't make wise investment. I'm not saying that uh, we shouldn't buy a house or any of those things. But I know in my heart of hearts, I got greedy. And I participated in, in the crowd in getting these dumb loans that I had no business getting. And, uh, you know, we lost everything we had. And we went from having, quote, unquote, all this equity into uh, uh, being in debt. And it took us years to get out. And today I, I think about that. You know, I think about the market. And I think about how, uh, you know, uh, in March 20th of 2020, a few days ago, uh, United Airlines was uh, pegged at $20.36 per share. And within a few days, uh, it's $37. Uh, Tesla uh, went down to about $500 a share. Now it's at $800. And in my mind and in my heart, I can get caught up in that again. And like I said, you know, it's not, it's not wrong to be wise and take care of your family, but it is wrong to, to really let our hearts uh, be like with the crowd and uh, getting involved in all that as well. You know, for the sake of time, I, I want to move in rather quickly on how God did this from chapter 24 all the way to chapter 31. He didn't start from the outside in. You know, a lot of times we explain things by looking at the big picture and we move in, right? But in the book of, of Exodus from chapter 24 all the way to 31, he tells us how this tabernacle worked and he gives Moses this instructions and he starts from the inside out. And he tells him how to build this ark, which contains the covenant itself. And he builds from within, out, inside to go outside. And for the sake of time, I, I, I want to just nail down this point a little bit as we close on out. He says this, he says, have them make an ark of acacia wood, cast four gold rings for it and fasten them to the four feet. And we'll jump into the yellow part. He says, insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry it. The poles are to remain in the rings of this ark and they are not to be removed. Then put in uh, the ark, the tablets of the covenant uh, law, which I will give you. God gives very specific instructions on how the ark is to be built, what is to be put in it, and how is it to be carried uh, specifically by God's word. I want to move this into a few hundred years into the future. When the ark was being carried into Jerusalem, and how David and his men, in the midst of their celebration, did not take this seriously, and how God took it seriously. We jump into a few hundred years into the future as we close things out in 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 1. He says, David again brought together all the able men, uh, young men of Israel, 30,000 in all. He and all his young men went to Bahala in Ju Judah to bring up from there the ark of God. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumble. The Lord's anger burns against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. You know, what we learn from this passage is God is serious about how he is to be worshipped. He is serious about his words. He is serious about what he gives us, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament today, that we need to really obey his words from the inside out. You know, I do want to close out, and there's one passage here in the New Testament, that what God says in the Old Testament, Jesus says, listen, the principle of it is not going away. God wants those principles to be applied today. We jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 14 in verse 18 to verse 25. 
And how is it relevant for our church today? He says this, Paul wrote, But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Paul's the same way. He says, he's, I'm a minimalist. He says, I, I would speak five words instead of 10,000. Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants. But in your thinking, be adults. But if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sins and are brought under judgment by all as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare, so they will fall down, not in the temple, but in our church, and worship God, and ex exclaiming, God really uh, is among you. You know, brothers and sisters, I think we have a great opportunity. We are in a period of time that's very uncertain. You know, God is calling us, I think, giving us time to really think and to examine to really look at our relationship with him individually and collectively as well. Let's use this time together and that uh, we are building our church uh, around the world, but certainly on the West side as well. So that when people do come and see, when they interact with us, when we get that chance again, they too will say, God is really among you. God bless and have a great week.